It's excellent to have this group here on a Sunday night. Praise God. We're going to just continue with our regular services now. Sunday morning at 10, uh, Sunday night at 6, Wednesday night at 7, and then Monday night prayer at 7 as well. So we'll just go right on through. And uh, we also have a Bible study uh, in my home at 7 o'clock on Thursday nights. And uh, typically guys were coming to that, but I've opened it up to whosoever will. So, all right. Well, everyone's healthy? Okay, good. Um, just want to let you know, next Sunday we're going to have our, our uh, Sunday picnic. I don't know that it'll be outside. We'll probably have it inside now in the cafeteria. But if there are those who want to go sit under the pine tree, they can carry a few chairs out there and sit out there and have a picnic as well. We're going to continue that on through. I think people were really enjoying the fellowship and the food and just getting a chance to visit. So uh, we just ask that everybody bring their own picnic lunch. And I think most everybody's used to that anyway. But we felt like having a potluck during this whole COVID thing wouldn't be safe. Uh, I think some people would say, well, were they sick when they made that? Were they? <laughs> so, so be responsible for your own food next Sunday, right after the service, we'll have our, uh, we'll gather together for food and fellowship and a good time in the Lord. Okay. Well, before we start tonight, uh, we're in Revelation chapter 16, so um, I didn't make enough notes, but you know what? Follow, follow along anyway, and sometimes it's better to just listen to the word of the Lord. It's coming straight out of the book of Revelation, so you can't miss it. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for the time we can gather together tonight. We ask that you uh, bless our service. Bless all of these that have come tonight. Lord, thank you so much for your people who are hungry for the word of God. And uh, I just ask, Lord God, that you speak through me and help me as I teach uh, on Revelation chapter 16. And uh, Lord, I pray you would reveal to us how this applies to us in this day and age. And we'll thank you and praise you, Father, uh, so much for your love, for your grace, for your mercy, for allowing us to gather together again. We ask your blessing on each and every one in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. <laughs> Amen. Are you happy to be here? Amen. Praise God. You know, I was reading uh, Hebrews chapter 10. And in verse 23 it says, Let us not forsake the gathering of ourselves together, as the manner of some is. And I kind of had like just a little daydream of standing before the Lord and having him ask me, And why didn't you gather together again? Uh, I commanded you to gather. So I've, I've come up with this, and I know it's scriptural because of Shadrach, Meshach, Bednego, Daniel, John, Paul, Peter, and the rest. Uh, and Jesus as well. Uh, when any entity asks you to disobey God, you're not in disobedience to God by obeying the Lord and not obeying those who tell you to disobey God. Uh, because where that goes is this. First it's don't sing, then it's don't preach, then it's don't gather, then it's don't have your Bible, and pretty soon you're in communism. So, uh, and I know, Elizabeth, you, uh, your relatives are all in a country where that's pretty much prohibited, isn't it, in China? I mean, I know, they have, uh, I know they have Bible studies, but I know a lot of them are underground. And so let's not take for granted our liberties to be able to gather together, amen? And there is a point when Christians have to stand and say, we will obey God rather than men. We have to do that. John did it. Peter did it. Daniel did it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did it. Jesus did it. And scores of others in the, in the scripture. And I think people misquote Romans 13 when they say obey the authorities over you. When the authorities tell you to disobey God, they're not the authority anymore. God is our authority. And I know you won't hear that preached a lot because people don't want to ruffle feathers and they don't want to cause issues. My question is, why are Americans trying to avoid persecution? Every other nation on earth is being persecuted right now for their faith. Why are we trying to avoid persecution? God wants us to stand up, amen? So here's what happens to people who didn't stand up. Revelation chapter 16. The Bible says, I heard a great voice out of the temple of God saying to the seven angels, 
Go your ways and pour out the vials or the bowls of wrath of God upon the earth. So the people who refused to believe the gospel, they refused to accept Jesus as Savior. They went along with the status quo. They accepted the mark of the beast. They just went along like sheeple. Unfortunately, this is what they're going to go through. This is realism. This is what will happen on the earth once the church of Jesus Christ is taken up into the clouds with the Lord Jesus. This is what's going to happen. Uh, in fact, this is the last seven parts of God's wrath. We've already gone through the first seven with the trumpet judgments. And some of you will remember that. The 120-pound rocks falling out of the sky. Uh, the, the locusts that had stingers in their tails that tormented men for five months. The fire that came and devoured all the green grass and one-third of the green trees. The star that fell into the ocean and, and killed uh, one-third of all the ships and all the things that live in the sea. I mean, it's going to be terrible. It will literally be hell on earth. So he goes on in verse 2 and says, The first one went and he poured out his bowl upon the earth. And that particular wrath, there, was, there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. And man, I know as a single parent, even at five and six years old after my daughter received the Lord, I taught her about the mark of the beast. I was the only living relative that she had anywhere close to her. We didn't know where her mother was. She had abandoned uh, Christina and myself. So I wanted my daughter to be aware and to be ready in case something happened to me and she had to go on alone on this earth. I wanted her to know about the mark of the beast. And this is kind of a humorous story. So when she was, I think, six or seven... They took those children, I uh, had her in a Christian school, they took them down to the Santa Barbara Zoo. And down at the zoo, they had a little stamp that they stamped on the kids' hands so they would know what school they were from and so that they would know, you know, this, this kid belongs with that group. Oh man, she wouldn't take the stamp at all. I mean, I drilled it into her. Don't take the mark. No matter what, don't take the mark. And I truly believe that the church of Christ will be gone by the time the mark comes around. But the scripture says, no man knows anything like he ought to. So I'm, I'm trusting that my studies have revealed to me that chapter 7 comes before chapter 14. Okay? We learned that in school, by the way. Uh, but in case that happened, I wanted her to be prepared. So when I went to pick her up that evening, her teacher said, can I talk to you a minute? And I said, sure. And she said, you know, your daughter refused to take the stamp on her hand. And I just laughed. And I said, well, great. And she said, uh, she said something about the beast and the mark of the beast. And we begged her and told her, no, this isn't the mark of the beast. This is just to get in the zoo. And she absolutely refused to take it. So they pinned a little number on her with the name of the school on her, on her little sweater. And they let her in. And I told the teacher, I said, I'm proud of her. Praise God that she stood up for what's righteous and right. And she refused to even take as a kid, you know. And some people criticize me for that and says, oh, come on. You're teaching your little kid that? Yes, aren't you? Aren't you? Because when that time comes, some who haven't received Christ will be left behind. And if they're not educated on what the mark of the beast is, they could very well be deceived into taking it. You know, the Bible says the beast deceived all of those who received the mark. They were deceived. So here, the first thing that happens to those who received the mark in verse 2 is there fell a noisome and a grievous sore upon them. So let's take a look at Exodus chapter 9, the book of Exodus chapter 9. You know, the things that were written beforehand were written for our learning. Amen? So that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. So God wrote things in the Old Testament 
so that we would have instructions for our life today. That's in Romans 15.4, by the way, that scripture. So bowl number one, or vial, the King James says vial, but it, you know, that kind of connotates a little vial when you give blood. Uh, it's more like a bowl. They pour a bowl of God's wrath on the earth. So in Exodus chapter 9, starting with verse 8, the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses and unto Aaron, now this is when they were getting ready to leave Egypt and Pharaoh wouldn't let him go. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take to you hands full of ashes to the furnace, and let Moses sprinkle it towards heaven in the sight of Pharaoh. And it will become small dust in the land of Egypt, and shall be a boil breaking forth with blains upon a man and upon beast throughout all the land of Egypt. So they took ashes of the furnace and stood before Pharaoh, and Moses sprinkled it up towards heaven, and it became a boil breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beast. Verse 11. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of their boils. For the boil was upon the magicians as well and upon all the Egyptians. So has God done this before? Yes, he has. I want to share with you a true story. Some of you have heard it. Some of you haven't. Oh, gosh, it's been 1986 or 7. I received, well, I didn't receive, but uh, at the time, my, uh, my daughter's mother, uh, Cynthia, received a package at her home. And so she took the package inside, and by the time I got off work, she was hysterical. And I didn't know what had happened, so I began to question her, and I said, why are you so freaked out? What's going on with you? And she was just hysterical. And I said, did someone come in here today? Did somebody call you and upset you? Is there anything happened today that was strange? She said, the only new thing that happened today was that a package came from UPS. And so I opened the package, and inside was a gold signet. It was a, a square, just a little bit smaller than this right here. It was a gold, completely full gold plated. And it had all these different marks on it. And on the back, it had my name and her name engraved on it. So I'm thinking, what is this thing? And one of the, one of the um, inscriptions on it was a bird. It looked like it was standing on one foot. And there was another inscription with a comb on it. And there was, I can't remember all the inscriptions. I didn't know what it was. But I called my friend who is a... Uh, uh, completed Jew, born again believer of Jewish descent and I said, you know, I got this thing in the mail and it's from our, my in-laws and it looks like something from Egypt, but I have no idea what it is, but man, uh, can you please tell me, because it's taken the peace completely out of our house. And she said, describe the, the signs that are engraved on it. And I described them and she said, Greg, those are all the plagues of Egypt. And I said, what? And she said, yes, these are all, where did this come from? And I said, well, it was mailed from Germany. So I called my father-in-law in Germany, and I said, Mike, we got this package from you guys. Where did you purchase this? He said, oh, we were so excited. We, uh, we paid a lot of money for that. It was $980. This is back in the early 80s, okay? He said, we were in this shop in Egypt. We were visiting Egypt and Israel. And, and, and we were telling uh, this man in the shop that, oh, yeah, our son-in-law is a pastor. And he said, oh, we have a special thing just for pastors. And, and he, engraved, uh, he engraved our name on it. And he said, uh, why? What's going on? And I said, all of the things that are engraved on this are from the plagues of Egypt. And they're idols. And this Jewish lady had given me these scriptures, and maybe you'd like to know them. Deuteronomy chapter 7, the last two verses. So I know there's some people that would say, well, that's the Old Testament. Where do you think we got the New Testament? We got the New Testament from the Old Testament. 
Okay, back in Bible days when John and Peter and Paul were preaching the word, what were they preaching? Well, there was no New Testament. They were preaching scriptures from the Old Testament. Every word of God is pure. Psalm 119, 140 tells us that. So in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 25 and 26, this is what the scriptures that my friend, who's Jewish, uh, born again, gave to me. She said, because uh, I said, what do I do with this thing? And she said, melt it and destroy it. The graven images of their gods shall you burn with fire. You should not desire the silver or the gold that is on it. One of the thoughts that came to me, Sandra, was, hey, I'll just melt this down and make a really nice gold ring and put some diamonds that my grandma had left me in it, and it'll be a sharp-looking ring. She said, you can't do that. You can't desire the silver or the gold that's on it because it's been set apart for false worship in, e in Egypt. It says, you shall not desire the silver or gold that's on them, nor shall you take it unto you, lest you be snared by it, because it is an abomination to the Lord your God. Neither shall you bring an abomination into your house, lest you be a cursed thing like it, but you shall utterly detest it, and you will utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. So you would think, well, wait a minute, we're in the age of grace. If I bring some African demon mask into my house, surely it won't do anything, will it? Oh, yes, it will. You opened the door up to the enemy to bring that into your house. And I've got some friends that are sitting in here tonight, and I don't want to point anyone out, but we've, we've been over and prayed for their home, and there was things in their homes, and they removed them, and the peace came back in their homes. You see, we can, oh, as Christians, we can't be demon-possessed. That's not going to happen. But we can be oppressed, and the enemy can come in if we open the door. Uh, I've known of, in fact, I think it was your children uh, that went next door and played with an Ouija board, and they came back to the house and had boils on them. And you were trying to figure out, what in the world is this? And the minute the kids told uh, mom and dad uh, what they had done, they prayed over them and, and cursed that curse in the name of Jesus, and they were healed. So it's imperative that we understand the things that were written beforehand were written for our learning. And if you really think about it just in common sense terms, was the book of Revelation written 2,000 years ago? Yeah. So was it written beforehand? So is it still for our learning? Because we could easily use that same excuse that people say, well, that's the Old Testament. We could use the same excuse and say, well, puh, that was written 2,000 years ago. We don't need to obey that. I had one lady tell me, that's, that's cultural. I don't have to follow my husband. I said, man, that, why do you think? And she said, because that's, that's old cultural stuff. That doesn't apply to a day. And I said, okay, well, if that doesn't apply, then does your husband have to love you? Because that's just three verses up from that scripture. So now, because it's cultural, your husband doesn't have to love you. And not only that, four verses down from that verse, your children don't have to obey you. Because it's all cultural. And then when you go further, servants don't have to obey their masters. We don't have to obey our employer at all. We can just tell them where to put it. Because it's all cultural. And that's the way Scripture gets torn down and gets put aside because people make all kinds of excuses. And what did Jesus say? My word shall not pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall not pass away. It's, it's good for yesterday, today, and forever. So let me finish the story. So I thought, man, how am I going to burn this thing? I mean, I got a Bic lighter, but that's not going to burn gold. So I remembered I had a friend who had a welding torch. And man, it was like a Friday night, like at 11 o'clock, but I knew my friend who wasn't saved, they'd be up partying. So I called him. And I said, hey, Zot, you still got your welding torch? And he said, yeah. And I said, I got something I want to bring over and have melted. Do you think you could take a few minutes and do that for me? And he said, tonight? And I said, yeah, I mean, sounds like you got 
things going on in the background. And he goes, yeah, I got a house full of people. Bring it over. So I brought it over and he looked at it and he goes, man, that looks like gold. And I said, it is gold. And he says, why don't you just give it to me? And I said, no, I'm not going to give it to you, bro. I'm not going to give it to you because then your house will be cursed. So we put it up on the table. He had this metal table, this workbench. He put it up there and fired it up with a, with a welding torch until it looked like red hot liquid. And I remember Zot hit it with a, with a hammer and it just went into a thousand beads everywhere all over the garage. Just exploded like if you've ever dropped a crystal glass. You know how a crystal glass just explodes? It was like that. And he said, man, what a waste of gold. That was probably worth a thousand bucks. So then I had to tell my father-in-law, <laughs> thanks for sending me an idol. So I called him, and man, was he ever upset with me. Well, what I didn't know is he also bought one for he and his wife. So they had their name engraved on it. And a couple of months later, he called me and said, man, we're just being plagued over here. I don't know what's going on. He said, Donna has broken out, and I hope Mike comes down here from Washington sometime, because I've already talked to Mike on the phone. We're good friends. And I said, Mike, if you ever come to Santa Maria, I want you to come to our Sunday night Bible study and share this story. It is amazing. He said, Donna has broken out in boils. He was a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force, so they got the finest medical treatment possible. They went to every doctor they could find who was a specialist, couldn't heal the boils. So when they got back to the United States, I kept telling him, Mike, it's that stupid cartouche. It's that Egyptian cartouche. You need to get rid of it. So he came to my house one evening and he said, I got rid of it. And I said, what'd you do with it? And he said, I put it in my safe deposit box in LA. I said, that is not going to help. It's still in your possession. And they tried everything. They went to dermatologists. They went everywhere to all the specialists. No healing. One night, it was about, mm, about 10 o'clock on a Friday night on the door. I opened the door, and it's Mike. And at, at that time, they did live in L.A. He was on an Air Force base down by Newport Beach, somewhere down there. So he knocks on the door, and I said, Mike, what's going on? And he had it in a paper bag, and he said, okay, okay. Let's get rid of it. Let's get rid of it. So I called Zod up again. He said, come on, bro, again? I said, yeah. He said, another gold thing? And I said, yeah. And he said, bring it over. So I took it over. We put it on the cement on his sidewalk. Heated it up with the torch. He hit it. Boom, it went all over the place. Within three days, Donna was completely healed of boils. And Mike will confirm that story if he ever gets to come here. It was amazing to me how God's word is true. Listen to it again. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 25 and 26. The graven images, the engraved images, in other words, of their gods, you will burn with fire. You should not desire the silver or the gold that is on them. You should not take it unto yourself lest you be snared by it, because it is an abomination to the Lord your God. Neither shall you bring an abomination into your house, lest you be a cursed thing like it. But you shall utterly detest it and utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. You go all the way back to Exodus chapter 20. Thou shalt have no gods before me, says the Lord. So I think it's so important for us to understand that, you know, uh, and you say, but where's that at in the New Testament? I'm so glad you asked. Okay, 1 John chapter 5. If you'll turn with me to 1 John, and it's all through Corinthians and every other place. But let's come to 1 John chapter 5. And let's start with verse 19, okay? Now, do we have idols in modern day America? Do we have any idols? Man, I've been in some people's houses where they have Buddhas. They have these demonic looking things from, uh, I don't know what country, but they, they're so ugly, just demon worship type little idols. 
Listen to what the Scripture says. 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. John writes, Brethren, we know that we are of God. Do you know that you're of God? Do you know that you're of God? Have you been born again? If you are, you are of God. But then note what he says. And we know that the whole world lies in wickedness. Verse 20. We know that the Son of God has come. Amen. And He has given us an understanding so that we may know Him that is true and that we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Verse 21. How does He end 1 John? Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. God knows that they have eyes and they don't see. They have ears and they don't hear. They have mouths and they don't speak. But what they do have is demons have been drawn to them because they were made to, to draw people to worship that idol. So demon spirits possess those idols and sit and, and watch in those idols. I'll give you an example in Scripture. They took the Ark of the Covenant into a house where they had Dagon, the false god of, I forget the tribe, uh, pick one, Amalekites, Amorites, whoever it was, Philistines, who was it? The Philistines. So they had Dagon, the statue, and they brought in the Ark of the Covenant and set it on the floor next to it. Well, in the morning when they had woke up, Dagon had fallen over. Now who pushed over a 400 pound rock statue? So they set the statue back up, and the next night, they had the, the Ark of the Covenant next to it and that false idol. And they came back, and David, if I'm not mistaken, it was the head was broken off, and the arms, I think, and the arms and legs were broken off. It's like, try to stand that back up. So does God hate idols? Absolutely, he does. A Christian has no room for any kind of idols in their home. And you know, forgive me, but Disney promotes witches and warlocks, and, but they're good witches. You know? <laughs> That's like saying, but it's a good, it's a good rattlesnake. <laughs> or it's a good fox in the, in the hen house. He won't eat the eggs and he won't eat the chickens. No, what is evil is evil, not what evil is good. And they've promoted that stuff for years and now he's got little girls all over the nation believing that, well, there's good witches and there's bad witches. No, there's bad witches, period. There's bad demons, period. And there's no, uh, you know, even the Harry Potter books uh, talked about sorcery and witchcraft. It's an abomination to God. And there's Christians who will fight you over that and say, but that's a great book. Well, if it exalts Satan, do you really think it's great? Amen? So, some of you needed to hear that. Anyway, verse 3. So the first thing that breaks out in Revelation 16 is boils. Anybody ever had a boil, by the way? Man, they're painful. And, and you know, my mom used to tell me, don't squeeze that. Well, that even makes it worse. You know, boils, can you imagine boils all over your body? So in verse 3, the scripture says, the second angel came out, and he poured his vial upon the sea and it that's the sea became like the blood of a dead man and every living soul died in the sea now one of the interesting things about the sea is is if you take a microscope and just take a, a little glass of seawater and put a few drops on a on a, a little glass plate and look at it there's all kinds of living things in there. Things you can't even see until you put it under the microscope. So the sea is full of life. All kinds of life. Big, big mammals, little fish, little amoebas, all kinds of things. The Bible says every living thing in the sea died. Can you imagine how much is in the seas of the world and they all died? So and the Bible says it stunk like a dead man, and I don't think we need to go into a description of that. That would be the awfulest smell you could smell. In fact, uh, 
my stepson Jason was an EMT for a while. And uh, where's Robert? You're an EMT. So he went into a house where a woman unfortunately had died and she had been dead for a few days. And that cured him of being an EMT. He said when he went into that room and smelled that smell, he said, I've never been able to get that smell out of my nostrils. He said, it just makes me sick to even think about it. And that was the smell of the blood of a dead man. So that's the next thing that's going to happen when angel number two pours out his bowl upon those who have received the mark of the beast. You know what? I think that's an excellent reason for us to be soul winners. Amen? That is an excellent reason for us to talk to our friends, our relatives, our loved ones about Jesus and, and help them to understand they don't want to be here during that time. They want to be in heaven with all of us who have believed. They do not want to be on this earth during that time. And we talked about it this morning in Psalm 139 where where do you hide from God? The Bible says if you, if you run into heaven, he's there. If you go into the grave, he's there. If you go into the deepest part of the sea, he's there. You can't run from God. And people think they're going to run from these things, and it's not going to happen. And we're only down to angel two. We've got five more to go. And then so in verse three, the sea becomes like the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. So let's take a look, if you'll turn back to the left, to Revelation chapter 8. Are you following me, church? Okay. Revelation chapter 8. And verse 9. The scripture says, after the second angel blew his trumpet, back in the trumpet judgments, verse 9 says, the third part of the creatures that were in the sea that had life died. And a third part of the ships were destroyed. Now the other two-thirds of everything in the sea is now killed. So there is no more fish, no more plankton, no more seaweed, no more any of that stuff left on the earth. And then verses 4 through 7 describe bowl number 3. All the rivers become blood in verses 4 through 7. The scripture says the third angel poured out his vial or his bowl upon the rivers and fountains of waters and they became blood. Can you imagine? I've been to some pretty awesome rivers. The Colorado River. There's a river in Oregon. Uh, there's so many different beautiful rivers that you can visit. Can you imagine all those rivers just becoming blood? Didn't say it was like blood. It said they became blood. So he says, I heard the angel of the water say, You were righteous, O Lord, which was and is and, and shall be, because you have judged this way. For they have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, so you've given them blood to drink, because they're worthy. Can you imagine? The scripture says, Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. So, the Antichrist spirit went out to make war with the saints. You remember those verses. The Bible says he overcame them. Many were slain. The Bible talks about how they were slain. They had their heads cut off because they refused to receive the mark. We read in Revelation chapter 6 that the souls of those who were slain were crying out to God, how long before you avenge our blood upon the earth? So they were slain, they were persecuted, they were tortured. It's happening today in North India. It's happening in Africa. It's happening in places all over Asia. Christians are being chased down and persecuted and slaughtered. And the scripture says, because they took the life of my saints and shed their blood, I'm going to give them blood to drink. How horrible that will be. All the rivers will turn into blood, the scripture says. Galatians 6, 7, as we said before, whatsoever a man sows, that will he also reap. Hey, if you plant carrots, you're going to get carrots. If you plant goodness, you're going to get goodness. And if you plant violence and looting and burning, that's exactly what you're going to get back. 
whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Ephesians, if you'll turn there with me, Ephesians chapter 5. Aren't you glad you won't be there? Aren't you praising God that you'll be with the Lord? Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Make no mistake. God's wrath will fall once the church is taken up. It's very plain from chapter 8 all the way through chapter 19, well, through chapter 18 and a few verses of chapter 19. The wrath of God falls for almost 11 chapters on this earth. The things that are going to happen are horrible, horrifying. I've had people to, why are you so freaked out about telling people about Jesus? I just tell them, why aren't you? If you really study and see what's going to happen on this earth, and what's going to happen in the afterlife, not just on earth. But if they perish without Christ, what's going to happen for eternity? Man, I'll tell you what, here's an eye-opener. Read Job chapter 14 through Job chapter 23. It describes hell perfectly, what it's going to be like. Nobody ever would desire to ever even think about going there. Or even think about having any enemies that you may have go there. God doesn't want anybody to go there. But a lot of people are going to go there, according to Scripture. Wide is the way to destruction, broad is the way they're at. So verses 8 and 9, let me go back over. Verse, uh, bowl number 1, this, this boil, this sore, fell upon people. Bowl number 2, the sea becomes like the blood of a dead man. And bowl number three, all the rivers become blood. So think about this now. Where are you going to get your water? All the seas have turned into blood. Dead fish and dead mammals flying everywhere, floating everywhere. And now all the rivers have turned to blood. Where are you going to get your water? You know we're 90-something percent water. You take away water from us, we don't last long at all. We can last a few weeks without food. But without water, three days. They say after three days, you're done. Yeah, you confirm that, brother? Three days. Yeah. So, bowl number four. So, because of my pickiness, I happened to notice on my carpet today when I pulled my bike back in the garage, one of my little chrome buttons fell off the bike. So I had just got through riding, and I looked on the floor. I saw this little chrome button, and I thought, well, where did that come off of? And I'm looking around, and I see it came off one of the push, uh, the push rod uh, Allen screws. So I went to put it in there, and guess what you do when you touch a hot engine? Oh, boy, that hurt. Right away, I laid hands on it. Lord, please. I don't feel any pain, but I heard the pssst. So I'm pretty sure I'll see that tomorrow. Can you imagine being scorched with fire? Because that's what happens with bowl number four. The scripture says in verses eight and nine, men are scorched with fire. They're given a taste of hell on earth. But the, but the problem is they still refuse to repent. Let's take a look at those verses. Verses eight and nine of Revelation 16. The fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun. And power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. Man, I, I can't think of a better description of scorch than when you take a hot iron and you accidentally run it over your hand. That's scorch. You know, we learn not to do that once we do it once, don't we? And then verse 9 says, Men were scorched with great heat. And they blasphemed the name of God who had power over these plagues. And they refused to repent and give God the glory. So even though they've gone through this boils, and now they smell the blood of a dead man in their oceans, and now they can't go to the river because the river's turned into blood, so then God says, will you come now? And he pours out this fourth angel's wrath which is scorching men with fire. 
So I want you to read, and they, then they won't repent. They won't turn. They harden their hearts and curse God. Look at Hebrews chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. I just watched a video on YouTube a few, uh, few weeks ago where a guy was street preaching. I don't know where it was. Some city, he was out there preaching the word. And man, this woman, and he wasn't being loud and obnoxious. He was just telling people about Jesus. And he had two or three people gathered around him. And this woman came out of the crowd. And you talk about a rebellious spirit, man. She got in his face, put her fist in his face, threatened him over preaching eternal life. You talk about hardened hearts. So let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. The Bible says, Seeing therefore it remains that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached did not enter in because of their unbelief. Again, he limited a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. And man, I know my heart was hard for a long time before I accepted Jesus. And it was by God's mercy that he softened my heart to hear about the wrath of God. And that's really what brought me to Christ. Some come by love, others come by fear. That's in the Bible, Jude 22 and 23. Some you must have compassion, that'll make a difference. But others you must save them with fear, pulling them out of the fire hating even their garment or their clothing that's spotted by sin. That's how God saved the Apostle Paul. He confronted him, knocked him off his horse in the desert, and said, why are you persecuting me? Scared the life out of him. Who who are you? Who are you? He said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And then he struck him blind and had him sent into a city where a brother in Christ went and laid his hands on him, and no wonder Paul turned around. He saw the great power and majesty of God, and I'm sure that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. So Paul came by fear. I think John, the Apostle John, and Peter and some of the others came by the love of Christ. But there were plenty that Jesus preached to and said, Woe unto you, uh, Chorazin and Tyre and Sidon. For if Sodom and Gomorrah had seen the things that I've done in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Therefore, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than it will for you. So Jesus preached just as much judgment as he did come unto me, saith the Lord. I think there's both ways. Some have a hardened heart and need to hear the message of eternal punishment. And some, right away, when they hear, Jesus loves you, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, they crumble and come. Never forget this. Was out knocking on doors one night. We used to do that in the first church I was in. People would visit, and then we would get the cards of those visitors, and we'd go out and visit them. Go out and see, you know, what's your name? Who told you about the church? Are you looking for a church? And then we'd ask them, are you saved? Do you know Jesus? And one night we knocked on the door and this guy come to the door, had a big big belly pot gut, smoking a cigar, had a beer in his hand. I thought, oh, this, this, this is going to be a waste of time. This, this, this isn't going to work. And I said, Les, you go ahead and take this one. And Les just told him about the love of Jesus and this guy's sitting there listening. Pretty soon he puts his beer down on this little table by his front door and he starts asking some questions. Pretty soon he flipped his cigar on the front lawn and and, uh, and Les asked him, would you like to accept Jesus, sir? And he had tears running down his face. Yes, I would. God does not see like man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. So this guy, from all appearances, was just, couldn't, couldn't even care less. He gets saved. Then a couple of days later, we go to this other person's house, a little, sweet little old lady. Answers the door. Hi, how are you? We said, fine, ma'am, how are you? We're here out visiting. Oh, where are you visiting from? We told her what church we're visiting from. 
And we said, we'd like to talk to you about the Lord. Slammed the door right in our face. You can't tell where people are. People will, some of them will harden their heart to where it doesn't matter what you say to them. That's why Jesus said, dust your feet. If they don't receive you, dust your feet, go to the next one. But go. The important part of that scripture is go. Don't just stop and give up. Go. Go to the next one. So, they refuse to repent even though they're scorched with fire. And then we get to bowl number five. I don't know about you, but this one would scare me big time. I like to be able to see things. I like to be able to know where I'm going. So, in bowl number five, verses Revelation chapter 16, verse 10, 11, the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the seat of the beast and his kingdom became full of darkness. So much so that they chewed on their tongues for the pain they were suffering. Now I think just about everybody in here has bitten their tongue. It's not something you want to do every day. Can you imagine chewing on your tongue because of the pain and because of things that have happened beforehand and now it's dark and you can't see anything? And what was their response to this? They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and they did not repent of their deeds. So now can you see God's heart in this? I used to read the book of Revelation like, yeah, get them! It's not that. God is upping the ante every single time and His heart is saying, will you repent now? Will you come to me now? How about now? Okay, turn that up, scorch them. How about now? No? All right, turn their rivers into blood. No? Still not going to repent? And I think what Scripture says is true. God is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but He is long-suffering towards us, not willing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And when you look at God's heart in these scriptures, what is the main focus? They did not repent and they blasphemed the God of heaven. I think his heart is not necessarily to whack people, but to bring judgment upon their sin so that they'll repent and come to him for salvation. But they're not doing it. So, vial number six comes. But before that comes, let's talk about darkness in the land. Still no repentance. So remember John 8, 12, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. He that follows me shall no longer walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. In other words, if you're not following Jesus, you're going to walk in darkness. He said, he that follows me shall no longer walk in darkness. That means we were walking in darkness before we followed Jesus. And once we follow Jesus, now we'll no longer walk in darkness. Okay, but let's take a look at Exodus chapter 10 the book of Exodus and the 10th chapter. Is this getting through okay? Am I making it plain? Plain enough? Okay. <laughs> One person said, why do you have to scare people so much? I said, I'm not, I'm not very scary at all. I cry at Hallmark commercials. I'm just talking about God's Word. And when you read God's Word and you literally believe what God says in the Scripture and don't paint it out to be a metaphor, it's scary. So Exodus chapter 10 and verse 20 says this, The Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he would not let the children of Israel go. And the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand towards heaven, that there may be a darkness over the land of Egypt, even a darkness that can be felt. I've been in that kind of darkness. You can actually feel it. It's so dark. I was in the caves in New Mexico. Forget the name of them right now, but I was a little kid. I was about 12. And we went into those caves, and they shut off all the lights. And we were standing on like a metal platform that had a rail in front of us, you couldn't even see the hand in front of your face. 
it was just, you could feel the darkness. And then our guide lit one match, just lit a match, and it lit up that whole cavern. It was amazing to me how one little tiny match lit the whole cavern up. And so one little tiny Christian can bring a great light into the darkness of our world. So in verses 12 through 16 in Revelation 16, the Bible talks about the sixth angel. We've already been through five. We have two more to go. The sixth angel poured out his bowl upon the great river Euphrates, and the water dried up so that the way of the kings of the east could be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are the spirits of devils that work miracles. So let's just park right there for a minute. Don't follow signs and wonders. The enemy can do signs and wonders too. We preach the word of God and then let God confirm the word with signs following. That's how Jesus works. He preached the word and then the signs followed. A lot of people follow signs. The enemy can give signs. You remember when Moses threw down his rod and it became a snake? What did the magicians do? They threw down their rods and they became snakes too. And there was all kinds of other stuff that they could do as well. The enemy can deceive by signs and wonders. So we follow Christ. We don't follow signs and wonders. The scripture says these are devils working miracles. They go forth to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to battle of that great day of God Almighty. Jesus says, Behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who is watching and is keeping his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And so he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. So vial number six, the Euphrates River dries up and devils gather the kings and their armies for the battle of Armageddon. So Exodus chapter 8, so we'll go back to Genesis and then Exodus, the second book in the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 8, verses 5 and 6. The Lord spake to Moses and said to Aaron, Stretch forth your hand with your rod over the streams and over the rivers and over the ponds and cause frogs to come up upon the land of Egypt. Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt and frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. Anybody here ever had a frog land on your face? I have. We have a, a thing called Mud Lake behind our house. And it's, it's like a big muddy pond. And all kinds of frogs gather there. And because I have a fountain in my backyard, the frogs come there too. So I don't know how this frog got in my house. But it's like 5 in the morning and I'm sleeping. And I don't know how you sleep at 5 in the morning, but here's kind of how I sleep at 5 in the morning. <laughs> okay, so I'm laying there. And all of a sudden, this thing hits my face. I do not know where this frog came from. I mean, I can't even imagine hundreds of frogs because there were hundreds and thousands of frogs in Egypt plaguing the people. Everywhere they went, there were frogs jumping on them. Now, I know there's some little kids that love frogs and they handle them. But this one landed on my face at 5 in the morning and I'm like, Ugh. and I looked over and it was, and it was a frog that landed on my, my face. I don't even know how he got there. But then he, he crawled over on my bed and I went to grab him and he jumped. He jumped onto the dresser. So then I jumped, now I'm mad. So I jumped up out of bed. I went to grab him and he jumped again. And I, you know, it's like herding cats. Forget it. It's, not, it's like herding bikers. You're not going to do it. They scatter everywhere. So I'm chasing this guy around my room. It's five in the morning. I'm making all this noise. I can't catch him. So finally I see him hopping around. So I slammed the door so he couldn't escape. And I won't tell you what I did to him. But he landed on the door. And little froggy didn't make it after that. 
But I am telling you what, can you imagine being in a place where it's so dark and then frogs are crawling all over you? That's what's going to happen. That's what's going to happen to these people who have not received the Lord, who refuse to listen to the gospel, who take the mark of the beast, who are deceived, who follow like sheep of the, the multitude to do evil. Unbelievable. So in Matthew 24 and verse 24, these kings are deceived and led into the battle of Armageddon. Guess who that's against? That's against Jesus. Now, now, think about this for just a second. If you saw Jesus Christ on a white horse coming down from heaven with an army, would you gather to war against him? No! We have common sense. We haven't lost our common sense. But these people get so deceived that they gather up to fight the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Unbelievable hardness of heart. So check out Matthew... Um, Matthew 24 and verse 24. And the scripture says, There will arise false Christs, false prophets, and they'll show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they'll even deceive the very elect. That's why we have to stick with the word of the Lord. Man, I have heard some weird preaching on TV. It's like, what book are you reading, dude? Or I could say, oh, come on, man. <laughs> but can you imagine how many false prophets there are right now? People that have deceived the body of Christ. I've met believers, well, people that used to believe, who are now in cults. And I've tried to talk to them and tell them, are you counting the blood of Jesus Christ as profane and now you're working your way to heaven? Oh, well, you know, I used to believe that, but man, they showed me so many verses where we have to toe the line or we're not going to make it to heaven. And I said, you know what? Did you toe the line to get saved? How are you going to toe the line to keep saved? The scripture says we are kept by the power of God unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. It's only God who can keep us. Psalm 121 says, He is your keeper. He is the shade upon your right hand. He's the one who keeps us. He's the one who presents us faultless before His throne. Jude 24 says, He's the one that presents us faultless. We can't do that. Think about this. If Jesus came back tonight, let's say if He came back in five minutes, is there anyone in this building that's pure and without sin? Think about it. You say, well, I haven't robbed a bank. I haven't killed anybody. But have you delayed to do what God told you to do? Have, is there hardness in your heart against a brother or a sister in the Lord? Have you judged someone from their outward appearance? Have you looked down on someone? Have, I mean, there's so many sins we can be involved in. And so there's none righteous, not even one. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 20, there isn't one just man on this earth that does good and doesn't sin. So when you get people to say, now you have to be perfect before Jesus comes, otherwise you're not going. Well, that's impossible. The Bible says they have all together gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none righteous, not even one. Our righteousness comes from Him. When God looks down at us, He sees Jesus, Dan. He sees the blood of Jesus over you. He sees His Son over you. That's why you're righteous. You're righteous in Him. Isaiah 54, 17 says that. Our righteousness comes from Him, not from our own works. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is a gift from God, not by works so that no one can boast. I mean, praise God for living a holy life, as holy as we can be. But as holy as we can be, there's holes in it. Okay, I promise you, there's nobody righteous. So aren't you happy that you're saved? Aren't you blessed that you don't have to go through this stuff? In, in uh, number six, people get deceived in uh, the, the sixth bowl. 
So here's what the scripture says about the sixth bowl. Revelation 19 verse 11 says, John said, I saw heaven opened. And behold, there was a white horse. And the one who sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, he is coming to judge and make war. I've had people tell me, well, you're not acting like Jesus. Jesus doesn't judge. Are you kidding me? Jesus is the righteous judge. He's coming not only to judge, he's coming to make war. He's not the long-haired hippie that has limp wrists and never offended anyone, like has been preached so many times. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. He's a living God. Hebrews 12, 29 says our God is a consuming fire. That's who our God is. And so he goes on to say, out of his mouth goes the sharp sword in Revelation 19. And with that sword, which I believe to be the word of God, he will smite the nations. You know, smite isn't a tap. Smite is like that. And that's exactly what the Lord's going to do when he comes back. I don't want any part of that at all. No part of God's wrath whatsoever. I am so thankful that Jesus Christ shed his blood to pay for my stupidity, my sins, my iniquity, my inadequacy, my failures, all the things that have ever happened in my life. Jesus paid for it. And he paid for yours as well. He paid for us with his blood. In fact, Romans 5.8 says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners. So if you didn't make yourself clean to get saved, how can you stay saved by making yourself clean? Only God can make you clean. Only God can cleanse you. Only God can make us holy. Only God can make us pure. We have to have a heart pointed towards Him, but only God can accomplish the work. Like Paul said, and I love what Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. But not I. It's Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and He gave Himself for me. Man, when you start understanding the love of God, it overwhelms you, doesn't it? I mean, I got scared into the kingdom. I had a preacher that would not relent. Man, that guy told me about Jesus every time I delivered Coca-Cola at Slick Six. He would not shut up, Ron. He would not shut up. And finally, I blew up in his face and told him, I don't ever want to hear Jesus again. And most Christians at that point would say, okay, fine. I guess you're going to burn. Not, not John Offerman. John said, well, I'll honor your request. But I wouldn't be a very good Christian unless I warned you about where you're choosing to spend eternity. And I said the famous word, whatever. Tell me about that then. And he said, all right, well, here's what you're going to have happen to you. And he began to explain to me about the wrath of God. And then he said, at the end of your days, at the very, very end, at the last moment of your life, the angels are going to come forth and they're going to grab you and rip you away from anything righteous that you knew. And they are going to cast you into a furnace that burns with fire and brimstone. And you're going to wail and gnash your teeth for eternity. That did it for me. That did it for me right there. It was like, okay, sign me up. What do I have to do? And for weeks I was tormented until I find, in fact, I got so depressed, I literally was going to take my life. I got so bummed about these angels that were coming after me. And, and I knew the wickedness that I had done. And I mean, some people have a hard time believing that they're wicked. I'm sorry for them. But anything that's not righteous and holy is wicked before God. Even religious works. That's wickedness before God. He calls it iniquity in Isaiah chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 7. Because people come to him and they say, Lord, didn't we do all these great things? We did these wonderful works. We cast out devils. We even prophesied in your name. And Jesus says, depart from me, you who work iniquity, making yourself righteous to work your way to heaven. 
I never knew you. These are people that are screaming, look at all the stuff we did. And Jesus is saying, you missed it. I don't even know you. You didn't trust me. You trusted in your own self. Psalm 52 says that. Psalm 52 verse 1 starts out this way. Why do you boast yourself in evil, O mighty man? Your tongue devises mischiefs and your tongue works like a sharp razor every day. God will likewise destroy you forever. And then it goes on to say, and the righteous will see and will fear. And then will laugh. And a biblical laugh isn't like our American laugh. A biblical laugh is, aha. You know, it's God was right. That kind, that's a biblical laugh. The righteous will see and fear and laugh at him, saying, Lo, this is the man that trusted in his own wickedness and would not place his trust in the living God. And that is a scary thing. How many people are out there trusting in their own goodness and their own righteousness? And you know, it is by faith alone, through grace, that not of ourselves. It is a gift from God. The only thing I can do with the gift and the only thing you can do with the gift is to receive the gift. You have to receive it. It's nothing you can do. We don't even deserve the gift, but we can receive the gift. I share that because there are some listening on YouTube tonight that don't know the Lord. And they need to understand that their goodness and their religious works and their religious pious selves cannot bring themselves to heaven. Only Jesus saves. Jesus alone. So we see these kings that are uh, uh, deceived and they're coming to battle against the Lord. And he ends the chapter this way in chapter 16. It's the last and final judgment, bowl number seven. And we've gone through seven of them. Boils, rivers becoming blood, the sea becoming like the blood of a dead man. Men are scorched with fire. Darkness falls on the land. Frogs, uh, spiritual frogs, demon frogs jump out and torment people. And then the final judgment, there's a great earthquake where every island flees away. Now think of, anybody been to Hawaii here? Gone. Every, Every island. Australia, gone. Crete, gone. Every island gone. Is Ireland an island? I believe Ireland is. Gone. All of those islands are gone. That's what the scripture says. Every island will flee away and then mountains will disappear. So let's talk about Mount Everest. I don't know how tall that is. Is it something like 27,000 feet? Is that about right? 29. 29,000 feet. Now, I've been up on a 100-foot ladder, and that was good for me in the Navy. Okay, can you imagine 29,000 feet mountains being sunk into the ground all at once because of a great earthquake? We're talking a great earthquake here. Great rocks will fall out of the sky upon the earth. It calls them a talent. And a talent is about 120 pounds. So can you imagine 120 pound rocks falling out of the sky? What are your chances? The Bible says there's still no repentance. Still no repentance. And that's what finally brings Jesus back to earth. He squoze the last grape and there's no more to squeeze. He's brought the last soul. He's brought whoever, whosoever will to come and the rest gather up against him. At this time, mankind blasphemes God and blames him for their anguish. And I want to close with this scripture, Matthew 21 and verse 44. You know, there's a lot of people, especially in the church, that don't want to hear and don't want to preach God's wrath. Jesus Christ preached more wrath 
than he did blessing in heaven. I challenge you to do this in your New Testament if you have a red letter edition. Take a yellow marker, a highlighter, yellow highlighter, and every place, now just take the red words. Don't take, you know, the words that are written, the red words, the words that Jesus spoke. And every time Jesus, in the red words, speaks about heaven or blessings, underline it in yellow. That stands for heaven. Every time Jesus speaks about wrath and judgment and fire and brimstone and judgment, underline it with a red or a, a, a pink eye, a highlighter, just something that will differentiate from the yellow. And then count up how many red marks you have versus how many yellow marks you have. I had a Bible teacher that uh, taught us to do that one time and I did it. Sure enough, almost two to one. Two to one red in Jesus' words. It's scary. But I think looking from God's viewpoint, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him, what did he talk about first? Shall not perish but she'll have everlasting life. God's whole heart is, I don't want you to perish. I want you to have everlasting life. I'm not willing that anyone should perish, God says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. I don't want anyone to perish. I want all to come to eternal life. But what did Jesus say about that? Narrow is the way, narrow is the gate, and few that will find their way into eternal life. But broad is the way and wide is the gate that leads to destruction. And many be there that go in there at. And I think our whole purpose on this earth is for us to share the gospel with others. This is why we put everything in the church now on YouTube. We put it on YouTube because there's people out there that will never darken the door of a church building. But they'll turn on YouTube and... You know, they'll watch something else and they'll come across this and, oh, well, let me listen to that. Let me see what that's like. And I've heard from people, even in Arizona and as far back as back east, that have sent in comments on YouTube saying, wow, I never knew this. It's amazing how many people can be touched just by getting on YouTube. And hey, we're in the, we're in the age of all the technology. We might as well use it. We might as well, might as well have it out there while we can. So in closing tonight, I want to give you a summary of Revelation chapter 16. The chapter gives us a picture of how far and to what incredible lengths God will go in order to see men repent and come to Him for salvation. Think about how far He went in the beginning. From heaven to earth. From earth to the cross. From the cross to the grave, and from the grave back into eternity in heaven. That's how far God went for us. That's how far He's going in the book of Revelation to see if men will repent. As we said before, Second Peter says, God is not willing that anyone should perish. God didn't want Hitler to perish. And I can't judge whether he did or not. Only God knows that. God did not want Saddam Hussein to perish. God didn't want those 3,000 people that hit the Twin Towers to perish. God didn't want all the people that have been destroyed in all the wars of the world to perish. So that all should come to repentance. Now what if they don't come to repentance? What if the whole earth's armies rise up to fight with God in the battle of Armageddon? That only comes by hardening the heart. That's why the scripture says, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it proceed the issues of life. Above all, we have to guard our heart, because that's what runs our life. Amen? Thanks for being here tonight. Thanks for listening. I know that's a lot to chew on, but if you take another look at Revelation chapter 16, you'll really see God's heart in there. I know it's terrible. I know the, the scorching and the, the burning and all the things that happen. It's terrible. But God's heart is, will you come to me now? Will you please come now? Will you please repent? And you know, I think in my case, John begged me to come to Jesus. 
John Offerman. I had a, a fellow visit here yesterday. We had a, 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 a black sheep bike blessing. You were here for that. Robert, you were here for that. Uh, your aunt was here for that as well. And a couple of other people came for that bike blessing. Yeah, Lori and Paula were here as well. And, there, uh, and of course, Mo and Tish were the ones kind of leading that whole thing out. And we had at least 60 motorcycles that were there and people that we prayed for. And it was so awesome just to be able to pray for people and encourage them and tell them about Jesus and hand them a cross to get them to think about the cross of Calvary. You know, I, th I think in this day and age, we've got to get to the begging stage. Paul said in Romans chapter 12, I beseech you, I beg you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. After all, remember where he came from, heaven shore, all the way to earth, allowed himself to be spit upon, mocked, scourged, nailed to a cross, treated despicably the scripture says in Jeremiah his visage his appearance was marred more than any man can you imagine marred more than and God doesn't exaggerate in scripture marred more than any man what they did to his back and ripping up his flesh and what they did to his face he was marred more than any man it is truly our reasonable service saints it's our reasonable service to serve Him in love. Amen? God bless you for being here tonight. Father, we thank You for the time we've been able to spend here tonight, Lord. I know it's not an easy message to listen to. It never is. No one wants to see anyone perish, let alone come upon the wrath of God. But Lord, You said that godly sorrow would lead us to repentance. And so I pray for those that we know, and we know a bunch, Lord, all of us do. Those who are not yet saved. Those who are putting it off. Those who have hardened their hearts and don't even want to hear it. We pray for their soul, Father God. We pray that you would have mercy. We pray that there would be those who would turn around. Those who would repent and receive you as Lord and Savior. So, Father God, I ask tonight that you touch those whom you choose to touch with this message. I thank you, Father God, that we can rejoice tonight that we know you, that we are born again, that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life, that we have eternal life, and that your word promises we will never perish, and neither shall anyone pluck us out of, their hand, out of your hand. So I thank you for those wonderful promises that we're secure in Christ. And I ask, Lord God, that you touch others who do not know you and let them have the same blessing we do. We ask this, Lord God, that you bless this video, bless this message, and help us, Lord, to do what's right in your sight by going and sharing your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen.